there, there won't be so much um, confusion next month. Um, and then with that, I'm just going to pass it over to Jake. He's already got his slides up and he's ready to go. Awesome. So you, you just to confirm, can see the full screen slide because I've got a different screen over here that has my notes. <laughs> we can see your full screen presentation. So you're good all, to go. All right. Well, thank you all for having me. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, thank you all for having me. I was really excited uh, to see Marcy post a call for submissions. And I have had something on my mind recently related to engineering and the ability for folks to write. So um, I made the submission. I thought about it a lot more and I've tweaked it a little bit. And I've really wanted to talk about uh, connecting because it really goes beyond writing. Um, and it gets into collaboration, context, and innovation. So today's talk has a little bit of a um, engineering slant to it, but I promise not to get too technical. Um, and I wanted to start off with a little uh, personal story of mine to illustrate uh, some of the challenges that we have today. So when I was in fourth grade, I stayed for after school, after school intramurals and I was expecting it to be volleyball. And I wanted to do that because it was a contactless sport. I was okay with that. Uh, but instead, after school, I was stuck there and they decided to do foot, play football, something I knew nothing about. And so I remember uh, catching the football and being so excited, wide-eyed, scared to death. And my body just said, my brain told my body, just run. And run I did. And I was so fast. I looked behind me. No one was keeping up until I realized I was running the wrong way. <laughs> so, well, crap. It turns out I didn't actually understand what was going on. And the reason I wanted to share this story is it illustrates misalignment and misunderstanding. So of course, being in fourth grade is way different than being an adult in a uh, professional setting, but it does explain and, and does illustrate uh, my point, I think, pretty well. Um, because communication, as everyone knows, is important in our daily lives. Um, and it really can be the difference between scoring a point and embarrassment or success and failure. So who am I? I'm Jake Miller. I'm co-founder and CTO at MetaCX. I was formerly the director of engineering at Salesforce for our flagship product, Journey Builder. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in English where I concentrated in uh, linguistics. Uh, I like to think of it as uh, the science of language. Um, my free time, I love, I'm an artist, I, I'm an oil painter, I like to garden, I'm a lot, lifelong learner, I'm a husband, a dog dad of two St. Bernards and soon to be a human dad, which I'm really thrilled about. Um, so uh, I'm also not a football player. <laughs> So why in the world would a CTO be talking about writing? So I want you to bear with me today because while you're probably here to find some tips and tricks about how to write and be effective, I wanna take you on a journey about what it means and why writing matters in, in communication in general, because communication is really just an ends to a mean, or I'm sorry, a means to an end. Uh, so uh, we'll talk about some of the science behind communication and collaboration and why it's so important. And then we'll finish up with um, some ideas you can take with you. But what I really want to get, what really, what I really want you to get out of today is less about tips and tricks and more about um, uh, something that's thought provoking for you. So you can reflect on it after this talk and take some of these ideas into your daily work lives uh, and, and apply those um, and share them with other people so that you can be a multiplier. So let's start out here. Secrets your managers aren't telling you. If you are a manager, you probably already know this. Um, if you're not, maybe you do, but uh, it's good to be fully transparent and just uh, state maybe the obvious. So when we think about our teams, there are the average performers. This is the vast majority of the people on our teams. We have our lower performers, who's a small subset. Um, low performers can be coached up. And then we have our high performers, um, which are uh, 
the few and far between, you can have great people, but you can also have exceptional people. And so what to talk, talk, today's talk about is how you can go from average or even great to exceptional. So you go here and it's really the yellow versus green and maybe blue, um, but really yellow versus green. So let's get started into the job. So what employers want from you. And uh, so innovation is paramount to growth. Um, in fact, 84% of executives said that innovation is important part of their growth strategy, yet 6% said that they're satisfied with how innovation or the innovation performance of their teams. So employers are looking for their employees to up-level their collaboration efforts. Um, so uh, also in a recent survey, there were 1,700 CEOs at IBM uh, polled, and they said that innovation collaboration was the utmost important uh, task or goal for their teams. And this was brought on by all the change in technology, how fast technology is changing, how fast insights are being surfaced. Um, and, and so they, they said this is important. So next what makes a great software engineer and really what makes a great fill in the blank your role um but this this study was actually done by microsoft it's actually a, in an agency outside of microsoft uh but they wanted to answer the question from a purely technical perspective what makes a great software engineer so they interviewed 2000 uh employees from microsoft they were considered the exceptional engineers and included engineering managers and executives because at Microsoft they're typically uh, also coders so people that are that can be hands-on um, and what the results were uh, were they the, the, the these individuals were uh, they paid very close attention to detail things like how you handled errors and all the way down to how you manage memory and performance uh, in the code itself and on the machines um, Probably the one I find most interesting is, and, and this is very relevant to the rest of the presentation today, is the mental capacity to think about and hold complex ideas in their head, how to build those mental models um, and take very complex, very large ideas across a whole system and hold them in their mind. And then ultimately, which is not listed here, but we'll talk about, is taking those concepts and being able to help other people understand so that they can bring people along with them. Um, these folks are open-minded. Um, they know when to stop thinking and actually start doing. Uh, and I think, I think those are the important points here. And so ironically, using two screens here, in my opinion, this puts a software engineer here. <laughs> maybe towards the upper end of average performers or the low end of high performers, but that makes someone great or near great. But remember, we want to be here, exceptional. So if we go look at job requirements, so I just did a poll or just pulled a bunch of uh, job descriptions uh, for software engineers and programming project managers um, out of Google. And here are a couple things I found. So Documents and demonstrate solutions by developing documentation, flowcharts, layouts, diagrams, charts. Um, so these things are written communication and visual communication. The next, clear and coherent written communication, including visual representation. Uh, these folks need to be able to communicate well through writing, creating flowcharts and diagrams, again, visual. Um, and then the last one is really applicable to any discipline and it's meeting with managers, stakeholders of projects and being able to clearly communicate the status on those and the details around uh, the projects. And so what recruiters are and, and, and employers are really saying, I think, is that they need problem solvers and they need collaborators. So they need people that can communicate in these different uh, ways, written, visual, uh, verbally. But, but again, that is a means to an end. Uh, they need people that can multiply themselves by having these strong capabilities. So 
here's a fun example um, of why collaboration uh, is so important. So you may or may not have known that Play-Doh was originally developed as a wallpaper cleaner. It was called, and I don't know if this is how to pronounce it, but Kutal, uh, that's my best guess, um, was invented in the 30s. And that was when households would burn coal most frequently. And so the coal residue would be on wallpaper and this product was used to clean it. Well, around 1950, uh, uh, there was a transition in homes to cleaner uh, energy sources, gas, electricity, where the city buildup was not a problem anymore. And so they saw sales decline. And so the president and CEO of the company was talking with his sister-in-law, collaborating, and she had read an article about how a nursery school teacher was using the material, it was non-toxic, to mold shapes and um, uh, uh, for craft projects. And because of that conversation, Play-Doh was invented, which is now a multi-billion dollar uh, business. A second example here of how collaboration is important is bubble wrap. Bubble wrap apparently was invented as a wallpaper. Who knew? Um, and unsurprisingly, it failed. Uh, then they tried to use it as uh, insulation for greenhouses. But it wasn't until 1960s, uh, the 1960s, when a uh, sales associate uh, figured out, hey, IBM just created these computers that need to be shipped, and they're fragile. Maybe we could wrap these, uh, their products for shipping material. Um, and there's, there's this myth that people just come up with these ideas on their own, uh, but there's actually a word for it. It's called confabulation. And it's a phenomenon when uh, social interactions um, and other ideas from others inspire uh, the insight. So things like bubble wrap then become products to wrap computers. Um, so these are so complex social interactions for creating new ideas uh, and ultimately innovating and, and creating products and services uh, that people um, enjoy to use. So again, collaboration, a means to an end. And Marissa Mayer, um, formerly CEO of Yahoo, said when you need to in innovate, you need collaboration. Could not be more true. So now we're going to go through, um, let's talk about how problem solving actually happens. And again, I told you we're going to go through this, uh, this cycle of uh, talking about some interesting points. They're designed to be thought provoking. Uh, so please do uh, keep going along with me here. Uh, so the problem solving cycle. This was a paper written in 1996 by Randall Whitaker. Um, and it's all about how uh, to manage context in enterprises. Um, so I thought this would be interesting to share. Here we go. So there is this cycle that we go through when we're solving problems. And the very first step is recognizing that there is a problem. That's probably no surprise to anyone. Uh, then we go into set the evaluation context. So the pur purpose of this is we are discriminating between what information is important and what is not to the problem at hand. And this is the point where people are then conceptualizing the issues and the information, pulling on past experiences, understanding the people involved, what time it is, systems involved. And then the next step is achieving what they call, or what he calls situational, the situational assessment, which is setting us up to decide on what our goal should be and then ultimately how to act. So Apollo 13. Um, Houston, we've had a problem. Most people recall this as Houston, we have a problem, but it was actually quote Houston, we have had a problem, um, is a great example of how problem recognition is uh, an, an important first step. So I really just kind of learned about most of this uh, early this week, because it's only Tuesday. Um, but can you imagine being 180,000 miles away from Earth, hearing an explosion in space, and not knowing what is going on? And so immediately, we are in, or they were in a position of, of recognizing there is a problem, and quickly going into that stage of uh, evaluation context. And this is where it took many people at Mission Control, and, and then those on board the shuttle, 
or the spacecraft to start building this mental model, the shared model of all the context around the situation, pulling from telemetry um, on gauges inside the craft itself, information about testing that had occurred um, on the, the, the components of the, the shuttle before it was launched, all this information being constructed. Um, now I wanna relate this to also a probably more accessible example that we all may have experienced. And that is in technology when we, uh, when we experience incidents. So uh, ma major issues occur in our software, we have to respond. First, we identify a, what we call an incident commander, at least most companies do this, um, which is kind of a silly name, I've always thought it was funny. But the purpose is this person isn't solving the problem, they are coordinating. Their sole purpose is to help people understand all the context, get all the right people involved that can quickly uh, set context and then solve the problem. And that is what problem construction is. Um, and it's important because it's the way to depict what's, what's going on. Um, and in this, uh, in this step, it's important to have diverse perspectives. So we all talk about diversity inclusion in our companies. This is one really good example of why that's important. Um, in, in, in this particular case, you know, domain knowledge, past experiences, past jobs is what's important because we're able to take ideas and experiences um, in the past uh, to uh, come up with different ideas on how to solve the problem. Uh, the second step is to reconcile discrepancies about what, what, what our uh, experiences were, and then eventually come up with that shared mental model. And by doing that, we've laid the groundwork to then clearly communicate. And so there's uh, a great uh, quote um, by Spencer Gardner, who was a mission controller for Op Apollo 13 and many of the Apollo missions. When you start working the problem and pull things together, it becomes less and less stressful because now you're concentrating actually on the problem. And that is uh, what we're doing when we're constructing these problems. There's also this interesting concept in psychology called flow. Um, in Malahi, Chixin Malahi, I think is how you pronounce his name, uh, coined this term. And what it really is, is a full state of immersion, being in the zone. And this chart illustrates at the highest level uh, what this actually means. And you can see that when someone has a low skill level and the challenge is also low, people become pretty much apathetic. If you have a high challenge and low skill level, level folks become anxious. But people that have the high skill and find something very challenging are able to get into a flow. And this is something that groups can do together, which is why it's important to have people from different perspectives. So that represent uh, different skill levels um, and folks that find different things or, or find different levels of problems challenging. And so this gets me to the actual problem with the problem <laughs> cycle. So, uh, there is this problem called a depiction bottleneck. So you've got a problem recognition, which is collecting the information in the physical world, and then the evaluation context, which is then constructing the mental models around that. So what's happening, gonna happen is when you're working with your team to uh, build that mental model, there's gonna be a bottleneck there where you're gonna have to get people on board so that they can make the leap to understand things the same way that you do. And this is something um, that I found the uh, exceptional performers uh, are able to do. And it's very important to being able to communicate. You have to be able to get people um, in the same place um, as you. And as an example, I think I'm, I'm gonna skip that sucker there. Okay. Uh, okay, so how mental models work. Um, the idea is everyone has their own worldview. Everyone has their own way of looking at problems. The goal when you're problem solving and communicating is to get everyone to have the shared understanding and have the same mental model. A fun way uh, to, to illustrate this is um, a biologist, Robert Sapolsky, uh, asked 
why did the chicken cross the road? And then he says, if you're an evolutionary biologist, you might say the chicken crossed the road because they saw a potential mate on the other side. If it's a kinesthesiologist, they might say the chicken crossed the road because the muscles in their legs contracted and pulled the leg bone forward during each step. And if you're a neuroscientist, they might say uh, the chicken crossed the road because neurons of the chicken's brain were firing and triggering the movement. So that illustrates this idea that uh, your perspective is going to be different than someone else's and being empathetic about that will allow you to more quickly uh, come together in order to solve problems. Oops. Okay, so this gets me to context. Um, so collaboration really is the interactions of identifying the problems and building that shared understanding. Again, something that I find the exceptional leaders are able to do. Um, and context can be time, place, organization structures, power structures, mental models. Um, all of those are important. Um, and a couple just other concepts here. So information sharing can be a prompt. Uh, so leaders are able to, I should say it this way. So leading conversations is an art, especially when you're trying to, um, to solve problems and uh, information sharing can be a tool to prompt ideas. And this idea is diversification of these, uh, of these answers is really important, which is actually called divergent thinking. I think I've got a slide on this here in a couple minutes. Um, and uh, by having uh, multiple insights and different perspectives, folks will sometimes come up with what might seem like bad ideas, but those could, in fact, prompt other ideas that end up, uh, end up solving the problem well. Um, another idea here is what's called perception misalignment. This kind of goes along with what we just talk, talked about um, with the chicken crossing the road example. Uh, what I have here are three different flowers. The are, these are actually from my garden. Uh, you have a dahlia, tulips, and a rose, rose bushes. And uh, what I want to illustrate here is how uh, you could have very subtle misalignments uh, in concepts. So two of these, dahlias and roses, if you uh, cut the flowers back as soon as they start to wilt, they'll actually bloom more. You'll have more blooms on those plants. Well, tulips, if you cut them, they're done for the season. So while these may all seem like very similar things, they're all flowers, there is details that matter. And you may have people that understand those details and may, and may not. And this is, um, we're gonna talk about this idea of divergent thinking. This is really the what if. So throwing out ideas that may seem wild, may seem crazy, um, I've actually found the most insightful uh, sessions that I have had where the best ideas occur are where we, where we get in a room for some time and there's no real goal in mind. We just say, what if? What if we did this? What if we did that? Typically it's in product design, but sometimes it's in the, on the tech side as well. Um, uh, but the wet what if game, if you've, ever, if you've ever said, man, we could really use a fresh pair of eyes, that's because this person is probably saying what if. If you've said, oh, I didn't, I never thought about it that way, that's probably because someone's coming with uh, a different uh, thought because they're asking the question, what if. Um, and a fun example of how to sort of do a controlled experiment with this is what's called remote association. You're probably familiar with this idea, um, but to illustrate, I've got uh, three words here, farm, sky, and car. So farm being a place where you grow crops or, live, or, or um, you raise livestock, the sky being the atmosphere above us, and car being obviously a transportation machine. And when you take these words and randomly assign them to each other, they create different concepts. Um, again, this is something that I find exceptional leaders and exceptional uh, 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 employees are able to do naturally. Just take these different ideas, loose associations, and come up with new things, and then bring people along with them. So it's kind of a fun exercise. Sky Farm, 
well as that farm uh, that's on top of a bunch of skyscrapers? Um, is it uh, where you grow other skies? Probably not. Um, a sky car, a car capable of flying, or does it run on tracks like the L in Chicago? And a farm car, can you drive it around a farm or is it a car you built at a farm? I don't know. <clears throat> And then there's like this idea of additive tasks. And there's a really great book. Um, a lot of the stuff I'm drawing on today is from this book called Group Genius. Uh, and it's uh, this, a, a bunch of science and thoughts around uh, how, how collaboration can, can be very, very powerful um, in today's businesses. But there's this idea of additive tasks. And this is work where, um, I, each person in the group can add something to the solution that you're trying to come up with. And uh, there, the results of this, a study on this was that uh, groups didn't have as good of ideas. They weren't as successful um, when they were coming up with things like lists. Those are things that people can do on their own. Um, but they did very well when things were complex and required creativity. Um, and so uh, keep that in mind. Uh, that if you that the task that you have at hand is important when you're deciding whether to do group work or not. And I've got a couple idea more ideas on that in a second here. Okay, so communication. Uh, this is creating that context. This is where we start getting into some ideas that you can apply um, on a daily basis. Uh, so why is writing so bad to begin with? Um, I my personal observations is because we're not focused on the writing itself. Um, we're very often the folks that I would consider not exceptional um, aren't thinking about formatting. They're not thinking about how even when we're writing paragraphs and words um, or narrative, not summarizing, making things easy for people to skim and read and, and find information that they're interested in uh, going deeper into quickly, um, which is kind of goes into the know your audience um, perspective. Some other things, and this is just very uh, you know, tactical sort of thing is uh, an abundance of prepositional phrases. I am super duper guilty of this myself. Um, and I, I, I try to catch myself and the, quite honestly, the hard part with writing is it takes time. The more you do it, the easier it gets, the better you become. Um, but this is a tell, this is probably the number one thing that I've learned I can do uh, to be more effective in the writing so people can get more information out of it quickly, especially when you're talking to executives. So as a reminder, prepositions, as you may have learned in grade school, is anything you can do to a, to a tree. You can be in the tree, you can be around the tree, under the tree, on top of the tree. Um, and I, I created this horrible example, but it does illustrate the point. Here's a sentence. On the day of the 2nd of October of my favorite time of year, which is around the fall when blah, 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 could very easily have been written as my favorite season is fall on October 2nd, then blah, blah, blah. And then there's this idea of production blocking in meetings. Um, and I'm pretty sure every single person on this call has probably experienced this uh, maybe frequently. And that is too many people in the room, too many ideas, uh, too many voices. And what happens when you have more and more people in the room is folks have less and less time to contribute. And so you don't really get anywhere. There's really no um, uh, progress on coming up with solutions. Um, and it, it typically ends up in topic fixation where there are a couple folks that are fixed on a one particular point uh, and brainstorming just kind of falls apart from there. Brain writing. This is, this is actually probably the most important um, of all the, the, the tools you could put in your tool belt um, from my experience. And this is actually something I've very recently um, have fell in love with. So brain writing can be done in a couple different ways. This is also from the book Group Genius. Um, the, the author in that book explains it as in a session, having folks spend five minutes by themselves writing out ideas and solutions, and then the group coming back together and crowdsourcing those ideas to find the, the best ones. 
Um, another version of this that I absolutely love, especially with engineering teams, is prompt the, uh, the problem uh, ahead of time, build out a Google Doc or you know, document uh, where folks can collaborate on it ad hoc uh, and just let that be a ongoing living document for a week. People go back and forth, they're, they're challenging ideas, they're bringing new insights so that when you come back into a group, you have really good solid foundation to very quickly follow up and um, come up with solutions to your problems. This is something that exceptional leaders um, especially on the teams that I have had, are very, very good at knowing the difference of when to, uh, when to stop, how much information to provide, when to let the team come up with the ideas versus prescribing them for everyone. Um, because what that's doing is pulling people along and helping them to become better um, and not just feeding answers. And this is a very agile thing, um, quite honestly, you not wanting to be waterfall and tell other people how to do it by architecting and providing the designs um, that are so specific that our uh, engineers and developers uh, become uh, sort of uh, anemic, if you will. Um, another point, piece of advice here, this is another one of my favorites. So Hemingway uh, is famous for this quote, write drunk, edit sober. Um, I find this super helpful when writing, uh, not necessarily uh, emails, but things like uh, this presentation itself. Uh, write, 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 don't stop, come with ideas, word vomit onto a page, uh, don't think about grammar, don't think about spelling, don't think if you have coherent ideas or if there's a thread that's actually flowing through, just write down your ideas. Then go back and edit and pull ideas into groups, cluster them, start building your narrative in the thread. Um, this is just as important for um, you know, architectural documents, project plans, um, any, uh, and even memos, quite honestly. Let's see, um, So clear sentences. It's not an accident. Very few sentences come out right the first time. So what I just talked about with Hemingway, it's editing and editing. Um, and again, we don't have time in our day-to-day -day, uh, lives at work to tailor every single thing we write. And so that's why it's important and from my perspective to um, pay attention to the audience in the venue. Is it an email? Is it Slack? If it's Slack and you're talking to um, a, a peer of yours on a project, you have a very solid shared mental model on what you're working on. Um, you have sh very strong shared context. You probably don't need to worry about using prepositions or spelling. If you are trying to sell your idea to a stakeholder and get buy-in, you probably should care about prepositions and spelling. Um, and that's something exceptional employees are good at. And then knowing when to stop. And this is actually in the, the Microsoft example earlier on in the talk is um, exceptional uh, uh, team members know when to stop. When to stop putting effort in, what's the 80-20 rule, um, when to stop writing and actually go do. Um, they know they have intuition for that. And it's a skill you can develop. Um, for our developers, your code is documentation. <laughs> People are going to read it. It needs to be clear. Um, this is something, this is probably one of my biggest pet peeves is code that this document doesn't make sense or isn't documented at all. Um, it's not about you writing it here and now. It's not even about the team members that you've been collaborating with. It's about setting the context and the mental structures that shared mental models with people you've not met yet. So that's how we build uh, good code bases uh, that can live on for a very long time. Um, in fact, the code itself, in my opinion, um, is, is documentation. So visualizations, we talked about this earlier too, and these help you connect and help people connect. Uh, this is probably the number one thing that I recommend to 
engineers, um, particular engineers on my team that they can do to go from being really good at their job and really good engineers to being exceptional, to being the people that we're going to put in architect roles, to people that will become leaders. Um, I can't tell you the number of times I've, I've said, well, make a flow chart and have cross-eyed look <laughs> right back at me. Well, what do you mean? Well, well, I need to go do that. Uh, the exceptional people on teams are just making these. Uh, they're, they're using these in presentations. Why are they doing it? They're building these visualizations to build that mental model, that shared context, um, which is important to collaboration and important to being able to innovate. Um, and that's not just for developers to build uh, flow charts of how our software works. This is project managers, project, project managers, program managers, um, implementation folks. What is the process? How is it going to work? What's the start? What's the stop? What decision points are going to be made? All of this, it can make uh, 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 your, your concepts and ideas very explicit and very clear. So someone can look at it without having to talk to you and immediately understand uh, what you're trying to communicate. Of course, graphs and charts, um, probably the most obvious of them. Um, slides are a type of communication. Um, and then the last one is probably not as intuitive is project plans, spreadsheets. Those are actually visuals. Uh, yeah, we're creating the documents uh, in the sort tabular view, but think about when you're creating your columns, what are you putting in there? We're using green, yellow, red to indicate project status. We're putting uh, names of people uh, to have ownership. Are we thinking about uh, uh, the date, start and stop? You know, uh, something I find, uh, I guess this is sort of on the just conceptual level, but something that I've always found challenging is we have a start date listed for a project. Well, is that the start date of design? Is that the start date of uh, development? Is a start date of shipping? If there's an end date, is that the date the development team is done? Is it the date that it's going to be in production? What, what are those dates? Um, so all those things are components in communication. The exceptional uh, employees know that. Those that are good are okay at it. Um, so this is a fun uh, little <laughs> example here. Um, a slide. So baking cake. Uh, this is a, a little anecdote, a little story um, uh, about how small things in communication matter. So uh, a wife uh, had lots of things that needed to be done. Her husband wanted to uh, go to uh, a bar with his friends and watch um, a game, football. I wouldn't know anything about it. Uh, and she says, okay, well, that's cool, do that, but do me a favor first. I need to bake a cake, go to the store, here's my list. So he goes to the store, takes him a while, he comes back, he brings in a couple bags, uh, some have chocolate in it, a couple of other bags have uh, the shredded coconut um, and, and buttermilk. Um, then he comes back in with another big bag with four boxes of butter, then he goes back out to the car and brings in five big white bags of sugar or big five big bags of white sugar. And then he goes back to the car to get six dozen eggs that he had purchased. And then goes back to the car a couple times to get the seven big bags of flour that he bought. Now, his wife stopped, didn't really say anything until he was all done and then kind of gave him a look. And he said, and she said, well, why, why did you do all this? And it occurred to her that she had written a number next to all the things that she needed. So she needed one box of chocolate, two boxes of shredded, two boxes of shredded coconut. He bought seven bags of big flour. <laughs> and the the husband said, Yeah, I realized while I was checking out and people were laughing at me what I actually had done, but I didn't want to admit my fault and just paid for it and left and came home. So <laughs> It goes to show details matter um, and miscommunications can happen and sometimes they're funny. <laughs> uh, I already talked about that. Jake, I feel like that's what it's like to communicate with my husband sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all have our own stories about... How did you misinterpret that? <laughs> it's like one didn't have the period after it. Right. <laughs> Something <laughs> happened, yeah. <laughs> Um, our user stories um, 
provide context. Uh, they're the form of communication. And um, specifically for developers, um, going from uh, good to great, being good at this is really important. Um, I've found the best engineers that I work with um, are able to just write user stories, particularly when they're for um, a, a, a technical audience, but even when it's not. Um, and that, that's a, a skill, quite honestly, that seems very hard to come by. <laughs> Um, what's the level of acceptance criteria that you need to write? And, and a lot of that's just contextual based on the team um, to, to, you know, everyone in this group knows in Agile, we want teams to be autonomous, we want them to come up with their own norms. Um, and so being, being in tune with the level of detail that stories need, the level of acceptance criteria, um, sort of the rhythms and cycles, that flow we talked about earlier that teams can get into, um, excellent employees are in tune with that. And again, that, that goes across the board, not just engineering. And then finally, iteration. This is something else that us and uh, that uh, love Scrum and Agile um, uh, uh, really uh, like is the idea of iteration. And so all these things I talked about today that you can do, you can iterate on them. <laughs> uh, so, so the examples I talked about earlier, with uh, writing drunk and editing sober, practice, 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 you'll get better at it. So iterate to improve those uh, skills as well. It's more of an, a little bit of encouragement there. Um, so conclusion, my conclusion here, again, I, hoping this just brings new ways of thinking about communication and collaboration um, into your, your fold or into the fold here. Um, your job, if you're going to be exceptional as translating real world information to concepts, bringing people along to build mental models so everyone can collaborate together. Again, that can be in written form, verbally, or in visualizations, and then being able to convert it back. So from conceptual to action plans. Um, being a leader um, means connecting. Again, creating those visualizations, writing things down, bringing people along. When Scott McCorkle, our CEO, uh, said this to me once, and I absolutely love it and subscribe to it. We don't want to push our teams. We want to pull our teams. We're not there to push people along. We're there, there, we're there to be leaders, help build that context, help build the talents, and bring people along with us because we're excellent communicators and we're able to articulate our ideas, again, by creating context around it. And then I think, wow, yeah, lastly here, uh, impress your boss. <laughs> <laughs> if that's what you're trying to do to supercharge your career, either impress your boss uh, or uh, the person that's interviewing you, the business that's interviewing you, by taking these things into account. I guarantee if someone came into an interview with me and talked about how problem solving was related to collab collaboration and collaboration was about building the context, I would hire them in a heartbeat. Um, that's the level of detail of excellent performers, paying attention to how things actually work in the nitty gritty. Um, it, it's just incredibly valuable and says so much about a person. And quite, you know, that, that's something I think is innate in a lot of people. It's just a scary to bring up. Like, am I going to give too much detail? It's, it, yeah, I'm intimidated. Am I going to sound silly when I bring it up? And, I mean, even in this talk, I was a little intimidated to, say, to, to do it this way because I wasn't sure would the audience um, find it interesting or not. But you know what? Go out on, on, on a limb because um, I think people will find your perspectives important. And that is because you want to be here. So thank you, everyone. Uh, again, thank you, Marcy, for inviting me to speak. Um, I really enjoyed putting this together. Uh, I'd love to take any questions or stick around and chat um, if people would like to. Yeah, I think we've got plenty of time for questions. Um, just real quick, we've tried a couple different ways to get feedback um, to speakers in a quick, uh, fast format. I'm going to ask everybody to try a different way today. And down in the corner of your Zoom box, you should see some reactions there. Um, and I'm going to ask everybody, um, just to give some really quick feedback to Jake. If you liked the topic, give him a thumbs up. If you really liked it, give him a clap maybe. If you loved it, give him a heart. If you hated it, 
you know, you can put the crying face maybe. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just try that as a quick way for some feedback. And while he's uh, looking at questions, I love it. Uh, he can kind of see how many thumbs up he's got there and all, all that good stuff. Yeah. Um, I have, I'm going to open it up to questions for everyone else, but I have a question, Jake. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the challenges that, that I've had, um, I think as an agile coach is, um, you know, I use the, the collaboration a lot, especially when we're doing story mapping and, and things like that. I really, uh, depend on the teams to be able to both collaborate, to, to identify the problem, collaborate and document. And I really like that mental model that you had, um, that kind of showed, you know, the, the curve of where people are, right. They first yeah. want to know the problem and then they want to know it was the couple, it was back probably at the beginning. Um, it kind of, uh, described the, the, the problem and then they get to the context and some different things like that. Right. Um, one of the things that I think I've struggled with in story mapping you've always got a couple developers who are willing to talk and a couple that just won't, right? Or, or a couple that are willing to document or collaborate or, or what have you. And, and then a couple who just kind of hang back in the wings and they're kind of quiet. Um, I'll be honest, I probably find this more, especially when we have offshore developers, there's mm -hmm. a, a little bit of a culture, cultural context of, you know, I'm going to respect the leader to talk and let the leader talk and I'm not going to speak up unless I'm called upon. Um, do you have any techniques or, or any way that you've encouraged those developers to communicate uh, better or to collaborate better um, in those situations? Yeah, definitely. Um, so uh, j first on the, the cultural context, there was some research that I, I skipped over uh, last week because uh, it was too much content Right. Um, that uh, I'm gonna pull up and I'll, I'll send to you um, some ideas on that because I do think that's very, very important. And again, we're talking diver like diversity and inclusion. I'm glad you bring that up because that's part of what we need to do as leaders is figure out how to, to work with people that, have, that come from different um, backgrounds, um, especially when it's different cultural perspectives. Um, but to answer your question about uh, story mapping and getting people involved, um, you know, set aside the remote working thing, which I think makes it way, way harder. Um, what I've done, I've found a lot of success in it, is I will, uh, when I facilitate the conversations, I call on people that haven't spoken. Um, but I don't just say, hey, what do you think? I try and ask those questions that are pulling people along. Um, and I also like to encourage teams uh, to be wrong. So I think a lot of times when people are quiet, they're usually more junior people, in my experience. And I think it's because they think uh, they maybe don't know the answer or uh, they're going to sound silly or it's something that's not relevant. You know, there's actually one person on my team. She's rather new in her, uh, her career. She's been a, out of Coden Academy, been uh, with us for two and a half years. And one thing that impresses me all the time with her is she's not afraid to speak up. She's not afraid to be wrong. She's not afraid to, to bring those ideas to the table. Um, and so helping others see that in one-on-ones, uh, that, that's an example of being able to get in, in, in to participate, I think has been really helpful. Um, and then I, I would also say, um, I actually think today's content, it's something I'm, I'm gonna give the same talk to my team next week. <laughs> Um, and the reason is, uh, I think it makes people think about, oh, what are we actually doing when we're in these meetings? Because I think people don't find them valuable sometimes. Um, when, uh, you know, I, I've had someone on a, on a team before, I've had one-on-ones with, with this individual and said, hey, uh, why, why are you not collaborating? You know, we've asked, uh, you're, you're sort of working in a silo uh, that causes problems. We want you to participate. Why is that going on? Um, and I, I've had a hard time getting through on that one or I have in the past. And I think framing it this way really helps people see like, oh, this is how it fits in. This is why we're doing things the way that we're, we are. They kind of have it stuck in their mind. Well, I understand it. So why are we wasting our time in this meeting explaining it to everybody else, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that happens sometimes, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Or, 
well, I don't know, so someone else can can tell me. It's like it's a, that that psychological flow diagram I showed. It's sort of yeah, that the was the one left yeah. corner. Yeah, um, it's yeah. The, the the almost almost apathetic because it's maybe they feel like it's they're lower skilled and they're not challenged by it um, when in fact they probably are. So mm -hmm. I think it's our job to help people get there, but that's a hard one. I've, I've definitely had the same problem in the past. Marcy. Yeah, for the uh, agilists in the room, that's uh, something I know I harp on a lot is uh, the whole point of half of the scrum events is all about collaboration, right? And if you're going into a refinement session and it's just the BA talking the whole time or just your product owner talking the whole time, um, you're missing the point, right? That's uh, it's supposed to be for your whole development team to collaborate. If you're in your daily standup and they're giving just their status only to the project manager in the room, you're missing the whole point, right? It's to be communicating and collaborating uh, well with each other, right? Yeah. So good, anybody else have any questions they wanna ask Jake? Will Jake share his slides? That's the first question. <laughs> yes. You guys can yeah. unmute yourself, by the way. Yeah. I think I have kind of a question to build on some of that. A lot of times I hear from people that they're still thinking and processing and in the moment they don't have a lot of feedback to give, but later on they do. So I was wondering if you had any like techniques that you use with your groups um, to kind of help people who, who take a little bit longer to get there. Because I think yeah. I find that's, that's a big challenge. Yeah, absolutely. I'm actually one of those people. I have a very hard time in the moment processing information. I have to write it. Um, like I have, I don't know if you can see this. No, I have a green screen here. But I have um, literally in the past two years, about 30 of these big thick notebooks. And in meetings, I'll just one write. still did that, Jake. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I've got my very specific precise V7 pens that if I don't have these, I throw a bit. Um, but yeah, exactly. <laughs> But um, so I, I have to, like I said, process and writing. So I'm writing things down. I never go back and read it. Me um, <laughs> but, but when you're working with team members, I think the important thing is to give folks the space and let them know that it's okay to do that um, and, and reflect. Um, that book, Group Genius, I highly recommend that you read it because it does talk a lot about that topic as, as well. Not all the, the concepts are coming to mind for me. Um, but I guess the last comment on that, and I talked a little bit about it in here, is um, that sort of ad hoc process of collaboration where people go off, think about it, write their ideas down, crowdsource that information in a Google Doc, comment on it, have 15-minute conversations here and there with folks. I know it takes more time, especially when you're in these organizations where you need to ship, 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 ship software. Um, it can be hard. But I've found the best solutions have come come out that way, rather than these big group sessions where you know you don't get anywhere. And and also I, I will say I um, I I despise big group meetings. I, I find them I find them to be rarely effective. Um, so we we try and limit those unless unless it's about um, like brain brainstorming. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have a bounded topic. Hopefully, hopefully that's somewhat helpful. If I think of other things, I'll share it offline. Thanks. And I'm glad to meet so many processors. <laughs> I have, I am surrounded in a room right now full of notebooks that have been scribbled in that <laughs> I have never looked at again. <laughs> there, there's some science behind it. I'm going to search, I'm going to look, check that one out too, because there's, there's something behind it. I'm very kinetic. I don't know how this generation of kids that have grown up on iPads and, and, with laptops in their hands. I, I, I can't grasp how they compute things, right? <laughs> like, yeah. I have to write it to be able to remember it. Um, yeah. I never go back and look, but the, the mere act of writing it down will help me remember. I like the suggestion you had about putting a document out in an open space and then allowing people to leave it open for like a week and um, allowing people to go back. Um, I had never... I, I guess we've done that in, in a, a lot of situations, right? But I, I don't think about it being a, an intentional thing that you're doing to help those people like Megan mentioned who maybe don't process in the moment, but we'll go back and add comments later, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think an important thing when, like if you choose that method mm -hmm. 
is having a facilitator. So someone owns it because that person is going to be the traffic cop um, coordinating the information and distilling it. Um, but definitely. I was going to ask, I feel like I've tried that a few times with some of my teams and I stick the document out there and say, okay, you guys don't have a lot of feedback right now. I'm going to leave this out here. I'm going to let you think about it. And then no one ever goes back to it. So yeah. how do you get them out of that and get them to go back and think about it? Yeah, I think it's all about building ownership at that right. point. And because if, if, I mean, obvious statement, if people don't want to do it, they're not going to do it. Right. Um, but I, I wonder, I'd be curious if you experiment with this to talk to some of the engineering leads on your team uh, and say, hey, you know, this is a quality of an exceptional engineer. Microsoft said this, Jake said that. <laughs> And, uh, you know, this is a way to really boost your career and get more uh, insight and you facilitating. Um, you, have you read the book, Mul The Multiplier Effect? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's the exact same thing. Yeah. It's, it's the individuals need to be coached um, into uh, that role. Like, right. it, I can't do everything. Uh, my architect can't do everything. Our jobs literally is to build this context exactly. so other people feel ownership and can go do it. And that's an art. It's really hard to do. Yeah, it really is. It really is. Anybody else have any questions? I have a question. Um, how do you in get your uh, your audience to engage when they're when they seem to be distracted, like a distracted team member? You know, mm -hmm. kind of like playing on their phone or you know, they could be more engaged in the collaboration. That is a really great question. And you know, this is making me think, so our teams early on, um, we had some of that um, and then it disappeared. And I'm trying to think why it disappeared. Um, so I, I could think of a, a couple, maybe ways that you could tackle that. Um, I think, some of it's about framing the problem in a way that people will find interesting. Um, I, again, I, you know, that really goes back to building, I, I've said this like a thousand times in the session, but it's really about building that context and that shared mental model. So people are actually connecting. If someone's not, if someone's distracted and not paying attention, either they, they're distracted for good reason because they have deadlines that they're, they're not wanting to miss, or they're just not connected because they don't understand. And actually I've, I've typically found it's the latter. People don't think it's relevant to what they're doing. Um, and uh, something else I've done, actually, and actually I think this is the reason why we've been more successful um, with this at, on our teams at MetaCX, um, is full team ownership. Um, and that's getting uh, into that norming stage where the teams can become anonymous um, and they just participate. Um, so I don't think you'll ever get, get away. I don't think you'll completely eliminate that problem um, but you can do those things to help. Jake, are you I working? I was just going to ask, are you working with Darren Brown still? No. Um, we're at, at your previous startup, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, no, I was, I worked with Darren at, um, exact target for a while. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, maybe it's like another friend. I'm, I've got a couple of developer friends who are, are working with him and, uh, Jennifer made the comment here in the chat section, you know, have them turn their cameras on. And uh, Darren occasionally will post pictures of, I think it's, I think it's uh, Jeremy Sullivan and, and uh, 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 McCormick, Dustin McCormick, who are working with him right now. And I'll see him uh, post LinkedIn pictures of their team meetings. And they all will do something goofy to get people's attention online. And it's, you know, they wear a funny hat or, you know, wear a bunch of weird jewelry or something, uh, you know, to keep their cameras on and stay engaged. And uh, we started incorporating that in some of our, uh, you know, longer planning meetings and different things that we'll do. Megan's got her crown on. <laughs> um, and a lot of them will change their background multiple times throughout the meeting just to uh, keep people engaged and make it fun for everybody, right? Um, and it's, that's it's, great advice. It's kind of one of the things that people do to have fun. Yeah. Um, but I know one of the things that, that I do sometimes, there's a couple of things I do um, to help people stay engaged. And the first one is if it's going to be a longer meeting, you know, uh, if you're doing a day long, you know, 
planning session or storming set, you know, release planning or storm, uh, storm, brainstorming session. Um, we kind of put some parameters, you know, and expectations up in the front that kind of says, you know, we expect everybody to collaborate and be engaged and, you know, we'll put frequent breaks in where you can check your email or have 15 minutes to, you know, check email or, you know, do those kinds of things frequently. Yeah. But try to stay engaged. You set that expectation up front. And that was something when I used to give training, I used to not be really good about. Yeah. And I watched other professional trainers do it and realized that it really did set the tone for everybody. Um, and then uh, I also, uh, you know, as I'm creating the agenda, I collaborate with the team on what they want to see happen so that they're engaged and have that collective ownership, right? Like this meeting's for you guys. It's not for just me. Um, so what do you guys want to see happen in this meeting? Um, and that's one way to keep a team engaged as well. If they see what value they're going to get out of it, right? Sometimes if people aren't engaged in the meeting, it's because maybe they're, they don't see any value in that meeting. And that's kind of a sign that maybe you need to take that into the retrospective and talk about how to get more value out of that meeting. So thanks for the question. I think that was Aaron. Anybody else have any? Michelle brought up the team agreement. That's a good one, right? Yeah. I was going to say team norms is a great, right. yeah. And the one turning the cameras on, we, we have that um, rule too. Um, our scrum teams all adopted that. And I think it has made a huge difference. For sure. And, and ownership, like you're talking about, I think that's, Definitely been key. Alrighty. If anybody else has got any questions, speak up. If not, we'll let you guys get to a late dinner. How's that? <laughs> Maybe some of you have your cameras off because you're eating while you're listening. Um, <laughs> um, I think uh, we've got a couple people saying thanks. Um, when is the next great talk? Um, Ella, if you're asking about Agile Indies, um, we actually have Dr. Sushik giving our October the 14th meeting, which seems really late, but I think October is just an odd month where the second Wednesday fell on the 14th of the month that month. Yeah, the first is on a Thursday. So, um, and I actually have our next speaker booked, but I need to solidify that. We've got a couple of really interactive sessions coming up. Paul Boos has submitted. Um, those of you who know Paul Boos, he uh, is one of the board members of Agile Alliance, and he really uh, is one of the guys that got behind Agile Games and uh, has learned how to do some really great, you know, collaborative Agile Games online. So we'll have another interactive session. We're trying to kind of mix that up, right? Do some lecture talks and some interactive talks. So um, I know we've got some of those coming up and uh, of course if any of you want to submit uh, we are glad to take submissions as well or if you have a speaker you want to suggest. Other than that, thanks Jake, we appreciate your time and uh, we will post the recording of this up on YouTube. I think you were okay with the recording right Jake and getting that posted on YouTube. Good deal. Yeah, yeah. We'll thank you again. On YouTube, And if anyone you know missed it, direct them there. Thanks guys. Thanks Jake. Thanks again. See ya. Bye, thanks.